So D3, uh, there's a lot of examples that you can get started with at uh, Mike Bostock's uh, site. Uh, he's the creator of D3, he works, uh, I don't know if he still works at the New York Times, but at least when he created it, he used to work at New York Times. So if you've seen all of New York Times uh, visualizations, they're all built using D3. Um, it's a pretty cool library. <clears throat> so we're gonna look at uh, a few examples here, some of which are gonna be fairly useless, but they, uh, they show a point. So adding nodes, mapping data to nodes, uh, and then actually data-driven documents. So if you're, if you're looking at the GitHub page, um, there are gonna be examples one through six here. So this particular page, sourced.github.io slash Julia D3 tutorial slash D3, right? And if you're on the GitHub page, there's a link at the top. Like if you're on the GitHub code page, there's a link at the top. So the very first example, include D3. That's pretty much all it does. <laughs> it's more useful to look at the source code of this page. So essentially, include D3, nothing else, right? I'm not gonna spend any more time on that. Oops, I think I closed it. So more interesting is using D3 to actually add elements to the DOM. So in this case, uh, what all we've done is we've added a single rectangle to the DOM. That's, uh, we've added an SVG element. <clears throat> and the code to do that is here. So, we're actually doing several different things here. The first thing is d3.select. So we're selecting the body element. d3.select is your selector that selects one element that matches a particular selector. In this case, uh, we're passing in the string body, which means find every single element named body and return the first of it, right? Uh, if we were to do d3.select all, it would return every ta element named body. Now, in the case of HTML, there can only be one element named body, so select is fine. So select body returns the first one. And then what we're gonna do is append an SVG element to it. So what this does is uh, similar to uh, insert element. It'll add an element to the body, or insert child, I think, uh, called SVG. And now D3 doesn't actually care whether the, the element name you pass in is a valid element or not. It'll just go ahead and create an HTML element by that name. All right. Then what we do is, uh, now at this point what we've done is we've selected body, so what we're executing after this is on the body element. Now once we've done this append SVG, everything executed after that is on the SVG element. Right? So we've changed the reference from body to SVG. Then we set its class to histogram, we set it to true, and this classed method is something you can do to toggle a class, you can set it to true or false. So you would typically do it like if you're mousing over and you want to change something from a highlight to a non-highlight, you would change it to like selected true or selected false, right? Then we're setting the width and the height to be 95% of the window's height and width, right? So we've, we've done a few things, but they've all resulted in this particular rectangle that is 95% of the available window size, right? And uh, it's blue but we haven't told it to set it to blue here, right? So those are things you can do with, SV, with uh, CSS. It's just using CSS, say any SVG element should have a blue border of uh, one pixel, right? And so we get this blue border. So I like to move as much of the, the styling of my elements into, uh, into CSS and only leave things that are data dependent in my JavaScript code. Uh, a lot of the example code you'll see will actually have um, the styling also embedded in the JavaScript that will, uh, that's not really related to the data. I don't like to do that much, but sometimes you don't have a choice, especially with, uh, with SVG, sometimes what's inline overrides what comes in from the uh, style sheet, so you will have to use trial and error to figure out what works for your particular case, right? But my rule is start with the CSS styles and then if it doesn't work, uh, move to doing it in JavaScript. All right, so third example. We're now gonna add data. So we added data, but nothing really happened. 
uh, how did we add data. So this code was the same. We then created an array of data. So it's just a simple array. Then we did svg.select all funky. So this is selecting all elements with a class name funky. Notice the dot here. So the dot says something with a class name. If I used a, a pound symbol, it would mean with the ID of that. So in this case, anything with a class name of funky, I want to select and then assign this particular data, this data which I've created here, this array, assign it to that. And the problem is we have, there is no element named with, with a class name funky. So D3 doesn't do anything. It just says, all right, if there are elements, I will do something, but so far there are no elements. So we move on to the next example where we're actually mapping data to our document. So let's look at the code here, and everything up to this point is uh, the same, except we've now added this new section. So the first line there, funky.enter. What that means is uh, select, if we get data that's mapped onto elements that do not exist, that's what you do when that data is now entered into the system or entered into the document. So there are, there are three types of uh, selectors for data. There's the default selector, which means do it to all elements, regardless of whether they're new or not. There's the enter, which means any d data that's now come in and was new to the system. And there's exit, which is any data that's disappeared and no longer exists in the system. So in this case, we find that we have data, but we don't have DOM nodes that map to them. So that data is considered new to the system. It's now entering into the system. So for all data that's been entered, append a line, create a class, well, we have to do this because the next time we want to select it, we need that class to be on it. So we assign the class funky to it. Specify its x attribute, uh, x, well, it's a line, so it has an x1 and a y1, uh, x1 and x2 and y1 and y2. And we set that to 10, 500, 10, 500 for uh, all lines, right? And uh, stroke width and stroke, uh, these are just style elements. So what does that mean is, uh, well, it looks like one line. Right. If I inspect it, however, I find there are actually, how many lines are there? Six lines. So there's six lines, except they're all overlapped because they all have exactly the same x1, x2, y1, y2, right? Because I didn't actually drive it with data, I just did data mapping. So what I've, all I've done here is I've said, I want one element for every element in that array. Right? I haven't done anything else with it. So let's move on to the more interesting thing of data-driven documents, which is what D3 stands for. Right? So in this case, uh, everything looks more or less the same. Uh, I'm not going to worry about that. So in this case, I'm going to, so my enter is only going to have everything to create the element and to assign the class name to it, right? I'm also gonna have an exit, which means if suddenly data disappears from the system, I want to remove the element that it was mapped onto. And then I'm gonna have this, which applies to all elements. So it's, gonna, it's what's uh, the default selector or the update selector. And what I'm gonna do here is my x1 attribute is gonna be based on a function that's derived from the actual data. So in this case, my data is, uh, well, my data is in D, but I is the element. So any function that's passed to a D3 um, method, or D3 selector call, attribute call in this case, is gonna take in two parameters. The first is the data element, and the second is the index of that element in the data array. So in this case, uh, let's say for the zeroth element, it's gonna be, um, the data D will be two, and I will be zero. For the next element, D will be three and I will be one, right? And I'll, I'll trace through this code so we can actually see how it works. And what I'm gonna do is uh, take this and this, don't worry about this too much, it's just a scaling factor to convert that number into pixels, right? So that I can actually draw it on screen. And the same for my X2, I'm gonna take the next value and for Y1 uh, and Y2, I'm gonna take the actual value of the data, right? So, Let's, uh, let's trace through the code and see how that works.
Is everyone here familiar with uh, Chrome's Web Dev Console? So in this case, first iteration, D is set to two, I is set to zero. And the return value of this is gonna be I, so zero into X step, which is zero plus left. So whatever's the value of left, in this case, 60. So it'll go through and print my first, well, it's, it's only set the X values there, I think. Next one, and so on. Oh, I know what's happening actually, because when I open the web dev console, the height of my window reduced. So my scale is suddenly way off and everything is flat. <laughs> so uh, we've now got that. Now let's see what happens when I actually change the data. So what I've done is I've added this uh, node. And uh, if you notice that little uh, change listener that I added to the code, it's basically to detect changes here. So if I change this to five, it changes the data. So it's essentially updating that particular element. And again, it'll be useful to look at the DOM nodes here. So let's reload. So keep an eye on these elements here and see how they update whenever I change this particular code here. So let's see, I change that to five. So you notice how this particular thing changed? Because it's, that's mapped, that particular data element is mapped onto that last DOM element. If I change this one, it now changed this one, and it changed this one because those two points are mapped onto this particular element. Right? If I delete an element, that element disappears from there. If I add uh, two more elements, I get two more elements here, right? So that's basically how the data-driven documents work, is that as I'm adding uh, elements, that enter code is created, so it appends a new element to the DOM. Then the update uh, section is called, which updates the X and Y values. And if I remove elements, that's when the exit section is called for those particular elements, and they're removed from the DOM. Now this is very simple, I just did it for SVG lines, but you could do it for anything. And in further examples, we're gonna look at it for other charts as well. So in this case, uh, I have data-driven bars and the code is very similar. It is essentially the thresholds and the histogram data that I copied from my notebook. So that's here and here. And then I do something similar, I select all bars I have scales, so D3 has the concept of scales. You can do linear scales, logarithmic scales, categorical scales, lots of different types of scales. In this case, I want a linear scale. The idea of a scale is to map my data values onto my pixel values. So my screen is only capable of displaying a um, certain number of pixels, I don't know what it is, 2,000 pixels, well, we can always find out. How big do you think my screen is? Well, 960 pixels wide, so that's what it is when it's on the projector. It's probably different when it's not on the projector. So that, that's how many pixels I have, right? If I wanted to display a million data points but I only had 960 pixels, how would I display all of them? So <coughs> scaling helps me decide, well, how many, pixel, how many data points can I display and what resolution can I display them at? So in this case, I, I specify my range is the number of uh, pixels that I have available and my domain is the data points that I have available, my lowest and my uh, highest data points. And so I do that for the X and for the Y axis. And then I just do the same thing that I had before, bars.enter. In this case, I append a rect instead of a line. So previously I had a line. In this case, I have a rect. And I specify the height and width based on the data. So in this case, uh, this is just a function based on the data. Uh, and this. In fact, sorry, this is an expression based on the data. This is a function based on uh, the index of the data. So since in this case, I just needed the D value, or I need the total number of uh, uh, data points, I don't need to have a function. But in all the other cases for the X and Y, I need to know the actual data points. Right? 
So what I end up with is a bar chart that's completely based on the data. So any questions so far? We're going to go on to one more example, and uh, then I'm more or less done. Any questions? All right. So the cool thing, so far we've seen D3 and Julia independently. The cool thing would be if we could have our Julia code directly call out to JavaScript code instead of having to copy the, the, the JSON from Julia and paste it in Vim in my JavaScript and then execute it, right? It gets rid of me, which I like, because I can do other things. <laughs> right. So uh, this is a simple extension of what we know. We've already seen the case where we create a paragraph element and update the inner text. In this case, what we'll do is we'll create an iframe element, and instead of updating its inner text, we'll update the source uh, attribute of the iframe so that we now point to uh, our a D3 example inside an iframe inside Julia. So we'll go to look at example five in this notebook. So in this case, it's uh, the actual HTML we print out is a little longer, but the principle is ex exactly the same. So the first thing we do is print out this iframe now, a few things to note here is, uh, well, we've used about blank as the URL because we may not at this point know the actual URL that we want. All right. um, secondly, we have not uh, specified the width of the iframe. All right. So we specified a height of 500 pixels. And again, this is just a guess. We may not even need to do this here. What we do is later on, we create JavaScript that will determine the height and width based on the height and width of the window. That's because my Julia code is running on the server. It has no idea what my browser looks like. So it needs to let JavaScript figure out what the height and width should be. So again, I create that function, which is going to determine uh, what the width is. And I, I could also tell it to determine what the height should be. And then assign the URL based on uh, a URL that I've passed in, uh, that, I, that I'm going to pass in here whenever I call this function. And then. So let me just execute this. All right, so that's created the function. And then I create another function called update iframe. That's going to take in that particular ID that I created based on the, the random string. And it's going to take in a URL, and it's going to update the iframe's URL to point to that particular URL. So let's tie these two together and see what happens. So I've now got that iframe loaded into my Julia notebook uh, with a URL pointing to the, the GitHub page. Right? But that's not good enough, because I also want to pass in, uh, in data to that. So this is using data-driven bars. Now I'm going to call out to a different one. And so I call out to data-driven documents, which updated what was in this iframe. And it now points to this thing. So it's essentially changed what's in that particular iframe. Now, this is uh, somewhat cool, but it would be cool if uh, instead of just changing URLs, we also change past data into it, right? So that's what the next notebook is going to do is uh, we have this is more or less the same. And now we add a post message function. And what we're going to do is, because these two iframes, or the two frames, the Julia frame and the, uh, the GitHub frame are in different domains, the only way we, well, only two ways we can communicate are using a query string or using a post message. So we're going to use post message in this case. Uh, so we'll have post message uh, to send data to the iframe. Uh, we're going to JSON encode the frame. So like I, I told you earlier that you could pass in any Julia code in dollar parenthesis. So in this case, we're passing the entire JSON.json data. And we'll also update our example code. So 07D3. So let's go to that. So if I look at this, uh, it's actually not, uh, it doesn't have data in it. What it has is uh, a message listener. 
So it's going to listen to the message event. And whenever it gets a message, it's going to uh, JSON pass. Uh, I don't, in this case, it doesn't need to JSON pass it because it's uh, already, um, the JSON gets converted to JavaScript by the browser. So we directly get the data, and we can uh, try and draw our bars with that particular data. Right. So let's go back there. So execute this. Now we create that. So we've got, uh, in this case, we manufactured the data. Again, rather copied it from what we had before. So we've drawn bars based on uh, the data here. In this case, it's from the query string. But now we can pass in new data. So I'm going to pass in an array. And it's updated this particular histogram to use the new data structure. Right? In fact, this is where I the reason for using an iframe comes into play is because now what we can do is we can create multiple histograms on the same page without having their global namespace collide with each other. So I could have each of them with their own global variables. And in fact, with some D3 visualizations, it's hard to create the two copies of the same on the same page because there's a lot of D3 states stored within D3 itself. So I'm going to create this entire function that's uh, Similar to what I've had before, it's going to create these uh, user agent families, and uh, this time sorted by uh, the count, solid, sorted by beacon count. So I have the most popular browsers at the top and the least pro popular ones at the bottom. And then I'm going to, uh, groups not defined, so I think I forgot to do that. All right, I think this happened once before. All right, so this time it's updated this histogram based on the actual data from the data table. And let's try one more thing. In, in this case, what we're going to do is iterate through the top 10 browsers and draw a separate data frame for each, a separate bar chart for each of them. So I now have histograms for each of the top 10 browsers. And we can see how their, uh, their patterns change. So in this case, we've got like a, a double hump over here. A little more visible. In this case, with Amazon Silk, the majority of users are actually in that outlier bucket. Uh, the most uh, popular one, so Safari in this case, has very few slow users. Uh, IE has very few slow users. So most, most desktop browsers have flow, slow, very few slow users. Mobile Safari is like the exception of the only mobile one that has few slow users. Android browser has only slow users. <laughs> so I also wanted to mention that I, I have not used the D3's histogram uh, function and its own histogram uh, layout. The reason for that is D3 itself, like I said, it has a lot of these layouts that take in its, all the data points and it'll generate its own histogram. So you can pass in a million data points It'll generate a histogram, except it's really slow running over a million data points, or even 250,000. It works well up to about 10,000 data points. So what we found was much better is to do all the summarization and aggregation of data in Julia, and then just pass the summaries. So we wrote our own histogram layout, which is what I actually showed you in this, uh, in this chart, um, to essentially just take the, the heights of the different bars and just plot them rather than taking all the data points, figure out what the bucket should be, figure out what the heights of each bar should be, and then plot it. So it works out much faster to do uh, the, the analysis in Julia and just the rendering in, in JavaScript rather than doing everything in, uh, in JavaScript itself. So that, 
is kind of the last one I have now. I also have the uh, Jupyter API, which uh, unfortunately does not work with Julia Box because they've got a messed up access control allow origin header. Uh, so uh, basically you'll get a security violation if we try to use the API. What we can do is uh, I have uh, in my slides a few examples of uh, what we can, uh, so let's, let's go through that. So we can, uh, if you wanna do all of this right now, you open juliabox.org slash API slash sessions, and we will get a JSON array of all the sessions that are open. So in this case, it's showing me all of the notebooks that I just executed. They're all open with this. This is the kernel ID. This is the name of the notebook that uh, I ran. This is the session ID, and so on. So I can do that for, uh, for sessions. I can also do it for kernels. And I can get uh, notebook content, so let's go back here. So if I do that, it actually gives me the entire content of the notebook uh, split by cells, so I can iterate through every cell and execute it myself. And then you can also create a, a web socket, so the, the web socket that, uh, that the notebook server and the notebook used to communicate with each other. You can actually create your own copy of that and use it to interact directly with the server. So we kind of do that a lot at Sosta to have our own widgets. Uh, unfortunately, it is not possible to show that to you right now because of the bug. Uh, but I do have uh, one example of a notebook that we created uh, ourselves. So using similar data, it's, uh, it's got a whole bunch of visualizations, and I'm not gonna try and execute it now because uh, very often I don't have uh, sufficient Wi-Fi connectivity and the rendering will just uh, lag behind. So essentially what we have here is uh, we looked at a lot of data, analyzed it, uh, printed an overall histogram of the data, including uh, where the median was. So all of this using just D3, uh, similar to what you've seen uh, so far then we did a, what's called a dimension co-occurrence, and I'll try and zoom that up a bit. So uh, this is what's called a dimension co-occurrence chart, uh, which essentially shows us all of the dimensions and how they interact with all other dimensions. And for each of those, there's a histogram, so I can look at, for example, uh, just US traffic, or I can look at uh, different regions of the US. So in this case, the data is predominantly US. I could look at uh, just Windows traffic. And uh, we also tried to cluster the data somewhat uh, using a clustering algorithm. And that's what it kind of came up with. Which I should be able to zoom in and zoom out, but it's kind of slow. And lastly, I kind of integrated this with a leap motion as well, so I could kind of control it just by waving my hands, except that it's, uh, it's a very finicky, uh, so when I tried it just before the talk, it did not work. It, it was capturing the events, it just wasn't realizing what those events <laughs> mattered. So I, I'm, I'm not gonna plug it in, no. Maybe I can try. <laughs> we'll see, if it works, it works, you know. <laughs> I just always travel with my leap motion. Sorry, it doesn't work. <laughs> well, anyway, so that, that's kind of the analysis we uh, do. There's much more that we uh, do to interact with the data to let you drill down into, um, find out what actually, what performance problems are, exist on your website, what are the causes, looking at various third parties. Um, but that's pretty much all I have. So, any questions? Uh, 
Um, so, so yeah, I mean, our, our product is available uh, to anyone with a website if you want to use it. The data science workbench, uh, which is our combination, the, the uh, analysis tool I just showed you, um, that is available to anyone who uses our data because it's very tied to the schema that we've created for performance data. Um, but there, we probably will open source some of our algorithms. It's, it's really the algorithms. It's nothing else than uh, apart from that. Like Julia Box is open source. Uh, Julia is open source. D3 is open source. So if you have our algorithms and your own data, you could still do the same analysis we have. So the, the slides and the examples in this talk is kind of what's leading up to everything else that we have available. Um, the, the examples I showed you here with the, the dimension co-occurrence and the clustering, they're actually they're existing layouts in D3. So you can just reuse those layouts with our data. And there's a little more algorithms to analyze the data. Uh, <clears throat> we also did some amount of streaming of the data to D3. So rather than just doing bulk data updates like I showed you in the examples, We'll send a stream of data, so it uh, you know you're not just waiting for three minutes for it to render. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Animation. Yeah. Also, I mean, this analysis takes a long time. So if you're doing it on a million points, it's fine. If you're doing it on a billion points, it takes uh, sometimes like an hour to run, sometimes a whole day to run. So what we might do is rather than do it on a billion points, we'll do it on batches of 100,000 and stream it to you, or do it in real time, so you you, you know, every second it updates, showing you uh, what's available now. So those are, that's just beyond the scope of what I, what I could show you today. <laughs> All right. All right. Is there a word about a, a library or something like a black box in a lot of these concepts? Just be more straightforward. I mean, it's not Yeah. So one of the things we're working on is uh, rather than uh, doing all this with D3 directly, we're actually working on a library to tie Julia with C3. So C3 has uh, already got vi visualizations built on top of D3. So essentially what it would be is you have a, you call a charting function in Julia, and that would uh, create the iframe, pass data to C3, and render it in C3. So that's something we're working on that we will open source very soon. There's also a, a, a tool called Plotly, P-L-O-T dot L-Y, that's, um, they have open sourced their JavaScript library. And um, you still need to write some Julia code, but essentially you pass your data to a function, and they will render it in an iframe. So they'll take care of uh, creating that iframe for you. What's the project you guys are working on? So it's, uh, we call it the data science workbench. Um, it's it's going to be under Sosta's GitHub, so github.com slash Sosta. Or, again, if you go to the links in the slides, um, that's the, the main project uh, under that. We'll have it in there. Uh, my slides are again online, available at uh, died. Available here. So speakerdeck.com slash bluesmoon slash well speakerdeck.com slash bluesmoon is good enough. It's the first presentation up there. All right. Yeah. I'd say it's the easiest way to, uh, lowest maintenance, but uh, you can install it locally. So Julia, you, you, there is actually a REPL available. Um, let's see. All right, so you just, uh, you install it locally. There's a package for every OS available, and you can run things uh, in the REPL. So I could... Uh, Do you have to use the same file format? Uh, no, you don't. So you can just type in code. You can actually create a .jl file, just like a Python file, and execute it using the Julia interpreter, uh, and you'd get output. Uh, doing it within the Julia box uh, uh, UI is the easiest way to get the data to the, uh, to the browser. You could install Julia box locally. So actually, it's called the Jupyter project. The Julia box is an implementation of the Julia, uh, Jupyter project that uses Google App Engine. So if you wanted to use your own uh, thing within your company, that also uses Google App Engine, you could do that. If you want to use your own cloud service or your own uh, hardware, just install Jupyter, and uh, it'll set everything up. There's a few config options to specify, like your SSL certificates and uh, access control allow, origin headers, all of that stuff. But apart from that, there's really not much setup. You, you can be up and running in about 20 minutes. 
uh, from the time you know, start downloading to having it uh, available. And uh, yeah, once you do that, it's, it looks exactly the same as Julia Box, except the logo would probably be different. That's, you know, that's the only difference. Uh, we've done some changes, like we changed the CSS for our uh, particular implementation, but you know, nothing more than that. So we added a few things like uh, changing the theme. This is what the, the default looks like. This is what uh, our theme looks like. So it's just essentially we added some stuff for CSS theming. So Boomerang is a JavaScript library that collects data. So it's, it's the library that collects the data that goes into, in our case, in a Redshift cluster. And then we use Julia to analyze the data from there. So it's, it's just the data collection library. Right. Right. And again, yeah. Um, why, so why did you read uh, the Julia box over like an iPython notebook? So Julia box, uh, we, we don't actually use Julia box. We use iPython notebook with a Julia kernel. Um, but uh, Julia box is uh, the, the next version. So rather than actually train you on an older version, uh, I, I wanted to train you on uh, the latest version. Jupyter is the next generation of IPython. So the IPython developers have stopped working in IPython and moved all the efforts to Jupyter. Uh, so we, we looked at uh, various, we looked at R, we looked at Python, we looked at Julia. Julia seemed to be the highest performing in terms of just benchmarks that we ran. Uh, Python is uh, fairly good, and with the Jupyter, you can actually have interleaved code. So you can have uh, Julia code in one cell and Python code in another cell, and they can share data structures. So it's actually, you can get the best of both worlds. It's actually easier to find developers who know Python than developers who know Julia, but it's very easy to get a Ju uh, Python developer running with Julia. Like a matter of minutes to have a Python developer understanding and writing Julia code. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, thank you.